That was powerful. Thank you. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to Jonah chapter 4? We're looking for our last week at uh, Jonah uh, chapter 4 today. You know, every person, as you're turning there, has his or her favorite things. Uh, my favorite food, other than my neighbors who passed away a number of years ago, other than her potato salad, actually is pizza. Uh, my favorite color is deep red, anything burgundy, maroon, that I like. My favorite person next to Jesus is Karen. Good answer. <laughs> my favorite time of year is fall. Today is the first day of fall. I love fall. I just... My favorite holiday, if you know me, is Christmas. I get excited. I'm already reading a brief little novel about Christmas. Uh, it's sort of a girly novel, I'm sorry to tell you. But uh, if you know me also, you know my favorite sport. I don't even need to ask. Uh, it's basketball. Uh, back in 2018, um, I was at the doctor in Lynchburg, and uh, he said, you're done. He said, uh, you can't play anymore. I was 53. I felt like I played pretty competitive up to the end. I played with Sam and Mark. They might differ, but um, the doctor was saying, if you keep playing within five to ten years, you're going to have ankle replacement. Well, I'd never heard of ankle replacement since then. I've heard a couple of people who have had it, and so I took his word. But as I was sitting there and Karen was beside me, I said, you don't understand, I've loved basketball longer than I've loved my wife. I chose my adverbs carefully, longer, not more, all right? My favorite trip was Italy with Karen that this church uh, gave us. What a wonderful trip, so many fond experiences. I love going back and looking at pictures. Uh, I don't have a favorite child. I have three children. I do have a favorite daughter, Whitney, but she's my only daughter. Uh, but, you know, spiritually speaking, many of us have things that are very dear to us spiritually. For instance, you may have a favorite verse. Mine is Galatians 2.21, For I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness were to come by the law, Christ died in vain. That's a logical verse that speaks to the necessity of Jesus Christ. Think about what that verse says. That if we could get to heaven by what we do, why would God have sent Jesus to die? Have you ever thought about that? If I could get to heaven, a lot of people think I just have got to be a good person and God will accept me. Well, that's really a slight on God who has expressed to us that we need Jesus in order to be in right standing with God. But then they're my favorite chapters in the Bible too. Zechariah 14 is one of them. I have two that are tied. And I promise next year, I've, I've planned out through this year where we'll, we'll be looking, but I promise next year, and Karen will remind me, I'm going to preach a message out of Zechariah 14 because we'll be shouting that day. We'll be some shouting Baptists. But I love what it speaks about uh, the future uh, in that, and we'll be looking at that. But tied with that, is Jonah chapter 4. It's very interesting. Both of my favorite chapters are in the Old Testament. Uh, Jonah speaks to us in the past. We're looking at what happened in the past. And uh, as we look at it, uh, I can just visualize Jonah here in chapter 4. We're going to read it in just a moment. He had been obedient to what God had done. God uh, saved many in Nineveh. And you would think that Jonah would be happy, but he was not. But what I love about this chapter, whether it be Old or New Testament, is it pictures for us the love that God has for people who don't know him. And so here was Jonah sitting and stewing, yet God was at work. And so we want to look today at the heart of God. You know, a lot of people have a caricature of God. A lot of people picture God like that whack-a-mole. He's just waiting for people to get out of line and he's going to whap them. And so, so many people live in fear. Their, their motive for trying to live can be in the flesh and they're just going around all the time seeking to try to appease God in their own strength. There are other people who look at God as some grandfatherly figure who's somewhat detached but is benevolent and uh, accepts sort of everything um, and 
both of these caricatures can be wrong. If we're not careful, we allow our own preconceived notions to determine how we consider God to be. That's why we need the Word of God, and that's why we need chapters like Jonah chapter 4 that give us a glimpse at the heart of God. And so in this chapter, we're getting ready to read. We're going to see how he works in nature. We're going to see his dialogue with Jonah as he takes Jonah to school. And hopefully we can move uh, beneath the veneer of our own preconceived notions of God and greatly appreciate the heart that God has, not just for those of us who know him, but especially for people who don't know him, who may work with you who may sit beside you, who may go to class with you, who may cut your hair, who may wait on you at the store. And so we're going to look at that today. Look with me at Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Now he was displeased because, believe it or not, his ministry was successful. He preached, he proclaimed, he prophesied. The king and the people believed we saw last week and repented. But but rather than being the messenger or the mailman, as we saw last week, he wanted to be the judge, Jonah did. And so in verse 2, he prayed to the Lord. He said, isn't this what I said, please, Lord, while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. I want to stop right there. He was upset because he demonstrated the characteristics to Nineveh, but he should be very glad that God had demonstrated those characteristics toward him. Verse 3, And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord asked, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city, found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. He was hoping that things would change, that it would be to the demise of Nineveh. Uh, Verse 6, then the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. I'm angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, God, you love a lost world. Would that we have the heart for our lost friends and neighbors that you have. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for our neglect in this prime responsibility as believers to share in love and in the power of your spirit the fact that you are seeking out those who don't know you. God, speak in this hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said earlier, we're closing our study this morning in Jonah. It's been a brief study, but to this point, what we've seen, there's a tug of war between God and Jonah. God is a willing God who desires that people come to know him, in this case, the people of Nineveh. And Jonah is a reluctant prophet who only when uh, he did so, did so in obedience to God, not with a heart that would delight in what God wants. And so we see last week that in regard to what happened, God wins out. Jonah preached The king and the people repented in sackcloth and ashes. They heard God's word. They appealed to God's mercy. And the result was good. The people were saved. They made adjustments in their lives. But still not all was good. It wasn't good with Jonah. Because Jonah did not have a heart that delighted in it. And so today I want to see uh, how God, through this word picture, through uh, this visual picture of this plant, 
uh, with Jonah, uh, demonstrated to Jonah the stark contrast between him, God, and Jonah. I want to look at Jonah first, just briefly, and then we'll consider God. Uh, I, I want to note with Jonah first, he was a successful but sad prophet. He was successful but he was sad. He was a preacher who preached and people responded, yet he walked away from it dejected. It doesn't make sense. The only way it can make sense is something was awry in Jonah's life, and it was that he did not have a heart for God. He outwardly did what God called him to do, but he was not delighting in it. It reminds me of the illustration I heard a number of years ago of a little child who was in a primary school who disobeyed uh, the class's instructions, and so the teacher sent him to the corner of the room and said, I want you to sit down, and you sit down in that corner in that chair until uh, I tell you you can come back in uh, to the classroom. And the young boy went over that way. After about 10 minutes, he told the teacher, he says, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. You see, he was saying, I may be outwardly doing what you want me to do, but I'm not happy with it. And that was Jonah here. He was sitting on the outside. He did what God called him to do, but he was standing up on the inside. He had a defiant spirit, not a compliant spirit. You see, God had Jonah's feet. Jonah went where God called him to do. God had Jonah's mouth. Jonah spoke where God called him to speak, but God did not have Jonah's heart. I wonder today, does God have your heart or do you have a divided heart? Uh, does God have your heart? By that I mean, do you share uh, the same passions that he has? Do the things that matter to God, do they matter to you? Are the interests that God has, are they your interests? You know, I've recently been reading a book, a, a classic Christian book. I shared it uh, in our Sunday school class today, written by a man named Andrew Murray. It's called Absolute Surrender. Andrew Murray served God in the late 1800s into the early 1900s and wrote a, a number of books. And this title of this book is Absolute Surrender. I, I shared with the class, it's not something that you sit and read all the way from cover to cover. It's something that you read about uh, five pages of it each day and you marinate on it because it's really challenging. Uh, and one chapter he titled, The Fruit of the Spirit uh, is Love. And I want to read an excerpt from that uh, section. He said, when man sinned, why was it that man sinned? He was selfish and triumphant in his own spirit. Uh, he sought self instead of God. And just look, Adam at once began to do what? He began to accuse the woman of having led him astray. Love to God had gone. Love to man was lost. And look again, of the first two children of Adam, the one becomes a murderer of his brother. You see, the, the, the issue that was with Adam and with Eve, uh, they were selfish. They were self-centered. They were self-absorbed. They didn't surrender to God. They still wanted to do what they wanted to do. And that's where we find Jonah here in chapter 4. He had done what God called him to do, but his heart was not right with God. He was selfish. He was consumed with self. You know, we read through this entire book in Jonah chapter 1. He was disobedient to God at that point, yet what did he want to do? He wanted to take a nap in the belly of the fish. We see it even uh, when he's in the fish, he's crying out to God, but it's almost like he's crying out to God because he wants relief. And then we read the testimony and he's saying what? I, I, I. There are like 20 some times that he's talking about himself. And now after he had preached, rather than having a heart for the people of God and, and understand God's word was looking, was working like yeast through a batch of dough in that city. It was moving from person to person and amazing things were happening. Yet instead of being there in the midst of it and enjoying it, he determines to go outside of the city upset. And so we see Jonah's heart wasn't right with God. God accomplished what he wanted through Jonah, but it is a sad state of affairs to look at Jonah's life and realize that he missed the blessing of being an instrument of God. Do you know God wants you to be an instrument for him? 
to reach people. It may be through a kind act, through sharing a testimony. It may be through inviting someone to church or the crusade. God desires to bless other people through you. That's what he desires. And, and when we experience that and rejoice in it and stay in it, instead of as Jonah was on the outside, then it's a personal blessing. But en enough about Jonah. I want to focus on God. God is a passionate pursuer of the lost. A as we look at God here, and we looked at this truth a couple of weeks ago, the entire book of Jonah is really about God. It all starts with God. He, he's the one that initiates it in chapter 1. He's the one who brings it to the conclusion in chapter 4. Now, now Jonah is God's instrument. We know the people of Nineveh are the object of God's love, but make no mistake, this is a testament to God, and it is all about God. God. What do we see about God? Two main things. The first is this. He is sovereign. He is sovereign. Remember, Jonah thought that he could flee from the presence of God. He couldn't. God had the sea. He had control of the sea. He had control of the fish. He, he had a quiet time place for Jonah inside the belly of that fish. He orchestrated it where uh, the fish spew him out, where he needed to be, and then Jonah accomplished what God called him to do. So we see it in the early part of this book. But let's look here in this chapter. After seeing the people repent in verse 1, Jonah is very displeased. And then in grief, we see that he challenges God in his grace. We see that he brings out all these beautiful qualities of God in a negative light. He said, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, you're all of these things. But I don't like it. Why didn't he like it? Because he felt the people of Nineveh weren't worthy of God's mercy and grace. And so he sits outside of the city, verse 5. And we talked about, have you noticed how often Jonah wanted to remove himself from lost people? And, you know, when we're saved, we're to be salt and light. We're to be engaged with people who don't know Christ. We're to be in the world, not of the world, but we're still to be in and around people. How can people be saved? We saw last week, unless they hear. And how can they hear unless we're sent and we're there near them? And so as we look at it here, Jonah moves himself outside, tries to build a shelter, and then God begins to take him to school. In verse 6, we see that Jonah is outside and he's happy. God had provided a vine for the shade, this big leaf, this big vine that covered him. Jonah was happy about the vine. God sent a tiny worm. We talked about it. How sovereign is God? He used something as large as a large fish, probably the size of a whale, and something as tiny as a worm to accomplish his purpose. The worm starts to chew on the vine. Then it says that God not only appointed the worm, but he appointed the sun to come out, the east wind that was dry and hot to cause the vine to wilt in verse 8. And Jonah was sitting there unhappy outside of the city to the point of wanting to die. Now look at this. God has power over all of it. We see he's used a reluctant prophet to do what the prophet did not want to do. We see that he's orchestrated the sun, the moon, the fish. He's orchestrated the vine, the small worm, the east wind, everything to accomplish his purpose. And so we see that he's using all this to teach Jonah a lesson. He used the fish he used the tossing of the sea. He used the darkness inside the belly of the fish and all of that in order to, to get the word, to get Jonah to the point where he would share. And now he's ready to teach Jonah. You see, we need to understand as followers of Christ, God is working, desires to work in and through us to reach others, but he's also working in us that we might be what God has called us to be. But I want you to look at this truth, and it's this. God has a lot of tools in his toolbox. We've seen it here. And, and he is never taken by surprise. He can use anything that's at his disposal to accomplish his will. That should make us humble 
as we're messengers of the Lord, that if he can use a tiny worm, he can certainly use us, and it's not about our ability. But I want you to see, finally, he is loving toward the lost. Jonah felt these people unworthy, but God saw something in these people of Nineveh. You know, there's an account in the gospel that is very familiar even to nominal believers. It's described in each of the four gospels. It's the feeding of the 5,000. But like in Matthew's account in chapter 14, it says Jesus says he had been there a lot of the day. It was long, a long day that he had compassion, compassion on the people. He looked out over the crowd and he had compassion. That word compassion is the word splachna in the Greek. And, and it means guts. You know, we speak of the heart, but back then it spoke to the inmost guts of a person. Splack sounds like a gut type of word, but that's exactly what it meant. The inner part of God in the flesh, Jesus was moved. And so evening was approaching and there was a large crowd and they weren't near anywhere to eat. They were in a remote area and, and Jesus said it was time for them to eat. And the disciples would say, let's send them into town. And they can get and come back. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. And he took the few fishes and loaves. He multiplied and he fed the people. You know, we rightly focus on this miracle. It's one of the great miracles of the Bible. But what we really miss, if we're not careful, is the heart of Jesus. That he had compassion on people who were there to listen to him. Why are we to share Jesus? Because people matter to God. We should witness because we want to be obedient. God calls us to witness. We should witness because people need to be saved. Do you realize that there are people that may work with you that if they have not trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they will spend an eternity in damnation separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. And the, the hell is addressed a number of times by Jesus himself. It's a very real, real place. It's a very real experience. And we need to witness to people because we love people. and We don't want to see them go there. But we also need to witness because people matter to God. So God moves from the object lesson to direct dialogue beginning in verse 9. And he's taking Jonah to school. Jonah knows the what. He carried out the what. That was preaching the word to Nineveh. Now he's getting to understand the why. And so as we look here in verse 9, God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Now God had provided the plant and it gave Jonah great comfort. And then God took away the plant. He said, is it right? And of course, yes, it's right, Jonah said. I'm angry enough to die. And then class is in session. God says in verse 10, and the Lord said, you cared about a plant which you did not labor over and it did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who can't distinguish right hand from the left. Some people would say that would be children. I believe he's spiritually speaking. There are 120,000 people. They have no spiritual understanding at all, as well as a number, a number of animals. And so he's using that plant as an object lesson. Jonah was delighting in the plant while he was upset over the success of his ministry, over people repenting. He, he was consumed with the plant. You know, I was thinking as, as I was studying that this week about the things that really consume us. And I thought about there's the plan of five. What really lasts? All of these things that we're doing, what really lasts? In other words, the five test is this, will this really matter in five minutes? It may or may not. You may be upset about something and you're worked up about something and then five minutes later that 
thing is in the past, and you might think, why did I, why was I concerned about that? What about five hours? Five days, five months, five years. What about 50 years? If you're my age, all likelihood, you won't be here in 50 years, unless you're one of the oldest people. The things that you're motivated by, the plants in your life that you say, oh, this is so important. This is important to me, to my comfort, to my well-being. What will it matter in 50 years and then 500 years? We're getting ready to celebrate 175 years. There were a lot of people who invested faith in order that we would be here. I'm sorry to say I don't know their names. I don't know their stories. I hope to learn, but even if I learn, they ran their race, and their race is finished. You know, many of us, we're concerned about the plants in our life, what's happening now, and we're not concerned about the kingdom of God. God said, lost people matter to me. Should I not care for them? Real quickly, what did we learn from this? today. The first is this. God has a vested interest in people who are created in his image. And he doesn't qualify that because all are created in his image. He doesn't say this side of the tracks I love, that side of the tracks I don't love. He cares about all people, the poor and the rich, the young and the old. You know, back in the founding uh, days of our nation, Deism was a prevailing philosophy or wrong theology. And it was this thought that there was a God, but he was detached, is detached from people, that he was like the great clockmaker. He wound the clock, created it, wound it, and left it to itself. Nothing could be further from the true God. We see in Jonah chapter 4, he wasn't some disinterested clockmaker. He says, should I not care about them enough to send someone like you, Jonah, to them? And God is pursuing people in our circles, our co-workers, our classmates, our acquaintances. He cares about them. He desires to use us as instruments to plant seeds that they might believe because God has a vested interest in those he created. Secondly, people created in God's image are not fly by night. That plant came and it went. God was teaching a lesson first. Jonah did nothing to make that plant. That was part of the lesson. He said, why are you concerned about it? You have nothing vested in it. And I have a whole lot vested in the people I created in my image in Nineveh. But not only that, he said, and by the way, that plant, it rose up in a day and wilted in a day. But he didn't say the same thing about the people of Nineveh. You see, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that he has set eternity in the hearts of men. There's eternity in the hearts of men. We all want to live forever. That's why when we preach the gospel, uh, even by somebody who would rebel against God, if you say, would you like to live forever or would you like to know that when you die, it's all over? There's eternity in people's hearts. If they are honest with themselves, they want to live with ever. Only a fool would say, I don't want to live forever. God has placed eternity in people's hearts and people will exist eternally. I used to think, that only the saved will exist eternally. The Bible doesn't teach that. Believers will exist eternally in heaven, in eternal life. Unbelievers will exist eternally in hell, in eternal death. Now, death is defined far more than we often do. Usually we think of death as punctiliar and that's it. Spiritual death is different from physical death. The Bible teaches about an eternal separation from God. And this matters to God because people are not fly by night. You may be frustrated with that coworker. You may be flustered with uh, efforts that you've put towards someone. But those people matter to God. They're created for eternity. But then I want you to see a final truth, a lesson. When a person or groups of people get right with God, 
there's a blessing that goes beyond it. You see, Jonah was concerned about Nineveh. I hate those people was his attitude. They're wicked. They're, they, they do terrible things to people. They impale people. They, they treat people like savages would treat. And he's frustrated. But he didn't realize if they got saved, they would stop doing that. The world would be better. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul gives instruction under the Holy Spirit to believers who were married to unbelievers. And, and there could be this uh, false reasoning, well, I'm married to an unbeliever. I should separate and divorce from that person because I'm not to be unequally yoked and I just need to, to uh, find me a believing spouse. And, and God said, no. Believing wife, stay married to the unbelieving husband. Believing husband, stay married to the unbelieving wife. Why is that? Because there was a spiritual benefit for the unbelieving spouse by doing that. Do you believe God in that? Then obey God's word. But then he follows by saying not just that, but the children receive spiritual blessing. You can look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So how does this translate here in chapter 4? What, is, what does this have to do with Jonah chapter 4? Notice at the end, he says this, there are 120,000 people who can't distinguish between their right and their left. Those are people. And what? As well as many animals. Now, as far as I know, and this is biblical, animals can't believe on the Lord. I've never seen a cow repent. If you have, show me. Can cattle be saved? They can be physically saved, but not spiritually saved. We're created in God's image, not the animals. So what does it mean? What we can conclude is this. When a person is saved, it makes a difference in that family. It makes a difference. Even to people not directly affected by it, there's a direct effect. And, and when, a, when a community, when a community believes then there won't be as much crime. There'll be more righteousness. It has a rippling effect. And we see here for the people of Nineveh, not only were they saved, but it was better for the animals. It was better for the environment. And when people come to know Christ, it leads to better families, better schools, better workplaces. When a person believes unto the Lord Jesus Christ, that individual is restored to right standing. And if we have enough of them and enough of us, it will restore a community, a state, a nation, a world. We're entering a political system. Everybody uh, in a political time. Everybody has their opinion. Let me tell you, there's one righteous. There's Jesus. And, and I'm not telling you not to vote. Everybody should vote. We're biblically mandated. But I'm going to tell you, no man or no woman will right this nation. The only one that will do it is Jesus Christ. Because when people get right with him, then society gets right. That's why I'm excited about this crusade that's coming up. What God's preparing to do beginning next Sunday night. About six or seven different counties coming devoted to hearing the word of God. Unlike Jonah, there are a lot of people willingly and excitedly trying to see what God is going to do. I read on social media, and maybe you did this week if, if you've joined uh, the Southside uh, uh, Rick Gage Crusade, the group from Mount Airy a couple of weeks ago, they're so excited, they're driving up, I think, at least one night to be a part of it here. You don't think God's working? People don't just drive across the state line for just something that's average. There's an excitement. We need to be there. We need to invite people. Even if we invite people and they don't come, we need to be there praying. God, convict hearts. Whether it's somebody we look across and we say we know, or we don't know, we're praying that people would believe. You know, I began this message by talking about my favorite things. You want to know one of the favorite things of God, it's this, it's this, when somebody gets saved, when a community 
sees a number of people get saved. It moves the heart of God. How do we know it? Jonah chapter 4 proves it. Jonah 4 tells us people matter to God. Even the people that we consider to be unworthy of his grace, he reaches out to. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today with open hearts. Stir our hearts to have a passion for souls who don't know you. Lord, the stakes are high. People will exist eternally in one place or the other. Lord, you want them with you. God, you send us. God, you call us. And Father, I pray that in this coming couple of weeks that we would see a great movement of your spirit. Father, I confess to you that these are cynical days and we can get caught up in it. And Father, I confess to you any area of unbelief because as we look, we hear all of the bad. But God, you're still alive. And if you can work through wicked Nineveh, you can work through anyone. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.